In this part of the lecture, I will explain how ANOVA actually works. If you recall from part 1, ANOVA is a model for comparing any number of group means. It consists of a two-step approach that aims to reduce the chance of false positives from the multiple comparisons involved. First, an omnibus test is performed to see if there is any difference in group means. If that test is significant, then a post-hoc analysis is conducted to see which group means differ. The omnibus test is used to see if there is a significant difference among k group means. It starts by taking on the statement of no difference in group means. So the null hypothesis is that the mean of group 1 equals the mean of group 2 equals the mean of group 3, etc. But how do you compare all means at once? This is the trick of the omnibus test. It does not actually look at the means, but rather at the variance of the group means divided by the residual variance. The larger the resulting f value, the greater the evidence against the null hypothesis. To understand why that works, consider that if something does not vary, then its variance is zero. Hence, if the group means were indeed equal, then their variance is zero, and the resulting f value is also zero. The larger the difference in group means, the more they vary, and the greater your evidence against the null. So what is then the residual variance? Here is a simple visualization. Your data has some distribution. But this distribution is actually a mixture of the underlying distributions of the groups. When we subtract the means of those groups, then the observations are pulled together. And all that remains are individual differences from the group means. The larger the differences between these groups means, the smaller the remaining variance, and the more significant the omnibus test. This is the actual calculation of the f value. It might look a bit intimidating, but all it says is an unbiased estimate of the variance in group means divided by an unbiased estimate of the residual variance. You don't have to memorize this formula, but let me show you how it relates to the output shown in R. Continuing the example from part 1, say we have three groups, each with six observations. The first number shown then is the degrees of freedom for treatment. We have three group means to calculate the variance from and we have already used 1 to estimate the overall mean, so there are k minus 1 equals 2 degrees of freedom. Below that is the degrees of freedom of the residuals. We have 18 observations, and the denominator of the f-test uses 3 estimated group means, so there are 18 minus 3 equals 15 degrees of freedom left. The next column shows the sum of squared differences. For treatment, this is the sum of squared differences from the group mean to the overall mean, multiplied by the group size. For the residuals, this is a sum of squared differences from the observations to their group mean summed for each group. The mean squared differences is then simply equal to the sum of squared differences divided by their degrees of freedom. Lastly, we divide the mean squared differences of treatment by the mean squared differences of the residuals and end up with an f value of 28.97. The only question that remains is how to calculate a p-value from that. Much like the t-test, the chi-square test, or any other test really, this is equal to the surface area under the test statistics distribution from the calculated value onwards. This turns out to be around 0.000007, or in other words, really small. So what does that value mean? In a population with three groups that have identical means, there is a 0.0007% chance of drawing a sample that results in an f value as large as this one. Since this chance is extremely small, we stop believing in the null hypothesis and conclude a significant difference in group means. The postdoc is a lot easier to explain. Tukey's honest significant difference is very similar to a series of t-tests corrected for multiple testing. If you know what that means, then you know enough about the postdoc. Of course, it isn't exactly the same, or it would just have been called Tukey's bunch of t-tests. So if you're interested, look up Tukey's on a significant difference, or the studentized range distribution. The interpretation of each comparison is the same as that of the t-test, namely just the differences in group means given their standard error. If you haven't already, you can watch the video on the t-test and on multiple testing correction. This brings us to the most important difference between the series of t-tests and Tukey's honest significant difference. Namely, the p-values and confidence intervals have already been corrected for the number of tests k. That means that there is at most a chance of alpha of one or more false positives among all comparisons. 
Another thing to note is that if you do not need every comparison to answer your research question, then two keys on a significant difference will waste power on correcting for tests that you are not interested in. In that case, you can perform only the relevant comparisons with t-tests and correct for multiple testing manually. This is a decision that you should make before seeing the results of your experiment, lest the chance of a false positive is deceptively high. So what should you take away from all of this? The most important things are that you recognize what is shown in the output of an ANOVA, that you know what to look for when drawing conclusions, and of course that you know how to write such a conclusion. And that concludes the second part of the lecture.